Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, here's a picture of me and Francis. Uh, there's the title of my talk, but um, you know, a more informal <laughs> title is The Odd Couple, because Francis and I truly were the odd couple in every way. We were very, very different people. But we were brought together first as colleagues and then became really great friends through our love of, uh, obviously, this great artist, Jackson Pollock. I want to start off by telling you how I first heard about Francis. And so I have to take you back to um, the north of England in the early 1970s when I was this little 10-year-old sort of cherub in the middle here. And uh, one day I went into school and there was this cardboard box of what seemed like seemingly random books in there. And I pulled out this book on Jackson Pollock by Francis Valentine O'Connor. And uh, this is what he looked like, which, as you can imagine, to a little kid, Francis looked uh, just fantastically sophisticated. And he came from this far off exotic land, you know, called New York City, you know, wherever that was. And so it's absolutely amazing. His book was filled with obviously images of Jackson Pollock paintings. And although they were all presented in this very serious sort of monochrome, there was just something absolutely mesmerizing about these paintings. And so from there on in, I just kept on thinking, you know, what was this artist doing with this unusual painting technique? Now, the English educational system is absolutely notorious for encouraging this thing called the art science divide. At 14, I had to choose between the arts and sciences. I loved both, and so I just randomly chose the sciences. Um, and uh, it was a good choice. By the mid 1980s, I was at Nottingham University doing a PhD in physics. No great surprise, on that campus they had two completely separate libraries, the arts and the sciences at completely opposite ends of the campus. And so I would try and sort of contaminate the process by illegally sneaking in physics books into the arts library and just leaving them there. <laughs> And so, you know, in the evenings, I would, you know, hide in the corners of the arts library with my growing pile of illegal physics books and my art books. And always at the top was this book by Francis on Jackson Pollock. And so this is what, what really started me to think about Pollock. And, you know, whatever I read, it always emphasized this sort of deep connection with nature. So, you know, uh, Pollock's neighbor, Jeffrey Potter, remembered just the many hours that Pollock would just stare out at nature as if he was trying to absorb nature's patterns. His friend and sculptor, Tony Smith, mentioned earlier, you know, recalled one of the things that possessed Jackson was his feeling for the land. William Rubin, that many of you will know about, described his painting process as gardening, as if he was sort of nurturing nature on his canvas. And lots of writers would refer to Pollock's work as being natural, organic, and comparing his patterns to those in nature, comparing them to you know, the bare trees against the sky, the texture and thickness of lava, comets bursting into frozen visibilities. And because Pollock himself said, my concern is with the rhythms of nature, and even declared, I am nature. So I would sit there, you know, in the arts library and I would open up my science books to images of nature, open up my art books to images of Pollock paintings. And okay, there were superficial differences, but there was a clear shared underlying quality to them. So for example, this is the Pollock here, but it looks very similar to all of these other things. And I wanted to figure out, but what is that shared quality? And at the time, my scientific hero was this uh, mathematician called Benoit Mandelbrot, because he was asking exactly the same question. When we talk about nature's patterns, exactly what are they? So let's just briefly have a look at a very simple example. If you look at this snowflake, you'll see that it's got six arms to it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then if you look at the center, you'll see that there's another image with six arms to it. So what nature has done is taken a pattern and repeated it at a smaller size scale. And that's what nature does, it keeps on going. So with this snowflake, you can zoom in and the same patterns keep on unfolding. And all of that repetition of patterns builds a very complex and rich and rough and fractured pattern. And so Mandelbrot kind of grabbed hold of this word fracture and came out with a new word called 
fractal. And it's a weird sounding name, but all that it is is a repetition of patterns at different size scales. And Francis loved this uh, word. He even wrote a poem on it, which is really odd because there's not that many words that rhyme with fractal. <laughs> but he somehow succeeded. So that's it. Nature builds patterns by just repeating them at different magnifications. And what this mathematician Mandelbrot showed was that fractals are absolutely prevalent in nature. And he knew that nature was messy. So with nature, it's not that the patterns repeat exactly. They just look similar at different magnifications. But Mandelbrot became famous because he showed that they were absolutely everywhere in nature. So for example, lightning is fractal, rivers are fractal, mountains are fractal, clouds are fractal. So when you stare out at a typical scene, they're absolutely crammed with these repeating fractal patterns. And it turns out that it's the same for a Pollock painting. And this has been spotted. So Clement Greenberg observed that Pollock paintings were knit together of a multiplicity of identical or similar elements. So when you zoom in on a Pollock paintings, these similar patterns keep on popping up. And there are visual consequences of this. If patterns look similar at different magnifications, it's very hard to tell which magnification you're looking at. And that's certainly true of a Pollock painting. If you remove the context of the frame, it's very hard to tell. Are you actually at the back of the gallery looking far away, or are you close to looking at the detail? And of course, this has been noticed. So uh, quoted by Francis, Pollock is as strong from a distance as he is close to. Now with fractals, not only do they repeat at different magnifications, they repeat at different locations, and that produces a very uniform pattern. And of course, that's why Pollock's work is referred to as the all-over style, and Pollock celebrated this. You know, He said, there was a reviewer a while back who wrote that my pictures didn't have a beginning or an end. He didn't mean it as a compliment, but it was. If we go back to Rubin, Rubin emphasized the presence of patterns all roughly similar in character over the whole surface of the painting. So starting in the late 1990s, I started to publish various works in art and science uh, journals under the name Fractal Expressionism. And as you've seen, in a way, it's not saying anything new because all of these great scholars had unknowingly been seeing all of the visual consequences of fractals. But by declaring what Pollock's work as fractal, it did allow us to make a direct connection with nature. For in particular, scientists had developed lots of computer techniques to assess the fractal uh, patterns in nature. So we could just steal those patterns, those programs, and apply them to Pollock's work. And when we did, we found that Pollock's work was just as fractal as any patterns in nature. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the details of the programs, because since I did that around about 1999, over 20 different science groups have developed different types of computer analysis, all applied to Pollock's work. What I want to emphasize, though, is the usefulness of this. It allows you to ask, uh, ask some pretty central questions. So one question is, well, are these fractals uh, a product of the specific way that Pollock poured paint? Or is it just that if you poured paint in any way, they would generate fractals? It turns out to be the former, that part, it's a specific way that Pollock poured paint. And we can do this that Helen allowed me to have a, a research residency um, well, 15 years ago, I think now. And as part of that, we analyzed the patterns on, studio, on the Pollock studio floor. So that's the patterns that missed the canvas, and they are not fractal, while the ones that hit the canvas were. So clearly, Pollock was manipulating this fractal generation process. But where are the fractals coming from? Well, Pollock, of course, was an action painter, and so his patterns were a record of his physical motions in the air above the canvas. So presumably, they were coming from there somehow. Now, amazingly, if we get, pop over to the world of medicine, there's a whole field of research to do with human balance and how you actually balance so well. And they do all of these sophisticated experiments where they attach detectors to people so they can look at the motions. And these researchers have found that when you are uh, balancing, so this swaying motion, 
is actually fractal. You've got big sways and small sways all mixed together. So perhaps Pollock was tuning into this fractal physiology of balance. And this is where Francis came in. In the early 2000s, I started to talk to Francis because Francis mentioned that Pollock actually had very poor balance. And we've actually heard from earlier that Pollock was clumsy when he was dancing. Now, Francis felt that this poor balance was actually very, very influential in the way that the uh, artwork that he produced actually looked. So Francis and I decided to put this to the test. We said that we would grab a group of about 40 people who had good balance and another group who had poor balance. We would get them to create poor paintings. And if we were right, the fractal characteristics of the two sets of paintings should be different. So we took 40 adults who had good balance, and then for the people that had poor balance, we actually picked five-year-old kids because their physiology is not yet matured. So we got the adults, we got the kids, we got them to generate the two sets of poor paintings, and then we went looking for what was different about them. Well, I mentioned earlier that fractals generate this very rich, complex pattern because of all of that repetition going on. But some fractals are more complex than others, and you can see that in nature. For example, these, tra these trees intertwining in a forest, very rich and intricate, and produce a very complex fractal pattern. Uh, these Cracks in the middle are sort of middle complexity. And then these clouds produce a very open, sparse, simple pattern, low complexity. And we can train our computers to quantify that complexity. And so this is what this parameter D is doing, is quantifying the complexity on a scale between one and two. Closer to two is very complex. Closer to one, very simple. Now, if we go back to the medical world and their balance theories, they said, hey, people that have got very good balance have motions with a very high complexity, close to two. People who've got poor balance have very simple motions, closer to one. So if we were right then, that would translate into the paintings that they produced. People with good balance would produce very rich and complex patterns. People with poor balance, very simple and sparse. And that's exactly what the experiment that Francis and I devised actually showed. So this is a histogram. You can see this level of complexity here. These are the kids, the five-year-old kids. So you can see that they're peaking at sort of mid-complexity, around about 1.5. Here are the adults peaking at much higher complexity, 1.9. And this is where Pollock sat. So he sat in the adult distribution, but Francis was absolutely right. Pollock did have relatively poor balance for an adult, and it came through in his artwork, coming in at around about 1.7. And you know, Francis and I talked about this a lot, um, but it's not that Pollock was um, a victim of his physiology. He deliberately exploited it and refined it through the years. So this is a plot of the year that some of his paintings were painted, starting off in actually 1943 with composition in pouring, going all the way through to his big epic paintings. And this is the complexity. So you can see his manipulation process. He's gradually tuning that complexity. So these paintings are sort of the ones like Lavender Mist, Blue Poles, Convergence, Number 32, his big sort of what you might call the classic paintings. So that, of course, means that this myth, you know, that it's easy to paint a Pollock, which I know none of us in this room believe, but it is simply a myth. You would have to have Pollock's physiology, and then you'd have to invest that similar amount of time, a decade, learning to manipulate your physiology. And, of course, this has real practical implications, as some of us have been talking about. Francis cared deeply about authenticity and protecting that legacy of this great artist. And for those who know us, you can, you can hear Francis's yes. tone in this thing, you know. Uh, but he estimated that there were at least 350 unauthenticated poor paintings circulating uh, in the US alone, seeking the blind to buy them. That's classic Francis saying that. Um, so he was a big supporter of fractal analysis, of being distinguishing the fakes from the reals. 
So to quote him, these fractal occurrences in Pollock's pourings can be read as a very personal signature that can be found in all of his works. Francis described the fractal analysis as the tool with which the connoisseur can perceive falsity in a fake Pollock. So we first formally collaborated in 2005. Um, Avis mentioned uh, this kind of quite an active year or so uh, to do with what's loosely called the matter paintings. Um, today, in terms of what these computer analyses can choose, around about a 93% success rate in spotting fake pollocks from the real. Now, as David emphasized, though, this is not meant to be a standalone technique. The visual inspection of the connoisseur is absolutely central. So Francis and I were really interested in comparing the two. So through the years since then, and David emphasized, it's just absolutely astonishing how often we get approached and asked about paintings and whether they're real pots. We're talking about literally sometimes every week we will get an email. So through the years, Francis and I would swap notes. That when he received a, a painting, he would send it to me. When I received one, I'd send it to him. What emerged through the years is a 100% consistency between what our computer programs said and what his eye said. So Francis and I started to think, well, the computers in his eye might look very different things, but what if they're doing exactly the same thing? In particular, what if Francis's eye was actually just very good at detecting fractal patterns? And if that's true, presumably all of us are, some will be better than others, but in particular, Pollock was as well. So as we all know, you know, geography lesson, here you are. You know, in the 1940s, he, mid 40s, he moved to Springs, surrounded himself with that countryside and all of these fractal patterns, and that's when he started to produce his first major work. So maybe his eyes were absorbing these fractal patterns. So for the last 10 years, I've been collaborating with neuroscientists using all of these different techniques like eye tracking, EEG, MRI, to ask this exact question, can the eye detect fractal patterns? And the answer turns out to be uh, quite amazingly, powerfully, yes, that through evolution, we've surrounded ourselves with all of these fractal patterns in nature, and our visual systems have become very good at processing them. And this is called fractal fluency. Our eyes have become fluent in this natural language. And that applies whether you're looking at fractals in nature or looking at fractals in Pollock's work. And our results show some profound implications for your body. When you stare at fractal patterns, it actually reduces your stress loads by up to 60%. So if any of you have been staring at a Pollock painting and you feel that relaxation and resonance, it's literally because in some sense, your brains are wired to appreciate Pollock paintings. And that's the story of fractal expressionism. It could never have been told if it wasn't for these two great scholars, Benoit Mandelbrot and Francis O'Connor. And in the mid-2000s, I actually put them in contact with each other. I know they had a number of fantastic discussions about Pollock and beyond that. And for me, it's incredibly rewarding because this is a great demonstration about how easily the art-science divide can be defeated. All you have to find is a shared interest. And these two found it in this great artist, Jackson Pollock. So uh, thanks to Benoit, France to Francis, and thank you for listening. Thank you.